The Magnificent Battle, Merlin, Arthur's Court, and the Mistress of Time, by The Magus, read by The Magus. Part 1, The Adventure Begins. Chapter 1, The High Priestess is Dead. Long live the High Priestess. The High Priestess was dying. Breeson, the aged High Priestess, lay on her bed and thought back over a long and eventful life, knowing that death, the misunderstood comforter, was coming to take her home, back to blessed union with the Mother Earth from whence she had come. Death, a part of the cycle of coming into being and return, was not to be feared. To die peacefully in bed, surrounded by loved ones, was a blessing, not a curse. The duties of high priest had been difficult. Life in the world of the community had been satisfying, but always demanding and never easy. Yes, there was a high priest, but his responsibility was only for fertility of the land and ceremony. It was the high priestess who bore the burdens of leadership and decision-making in the land. For her, it was time for rest. It was time for her generation to pass on and for the new generation to arise. It was fitting that it should be before the Beltane, before the beginning of summer, so new life and new blood could begin with the fertility of the embrace of Mother Earth and Father Sky. She looked at the dark thatched roof over her head, watched the shadows cast by the candle that gently flickered in the warm moist air that blew through the hut. She listened to the constant dripping of spring rain as it fell into the thatching, then fell from the side of the roof onto the standing water on the ground outside. The sound of it reminded her of the cosmic love that embraced her, of the God in heaven kissing Mother Earth, a love that brings forth life. She was a part of something so much bigger than herself, so wonderfully fascinating and beautiful, such an exciting opportunity to love the world and those in it. Now, in this peaceful surrounding, she would merge back into the being from which she had come and be at one with the Great Mother. She thought back over her long life. She had been chosen the future High Priestess while still a young maiden, she had been so very honored by being chosen, and a young maiden would be happy to know that she would be high priestess some day. Oh, there were obligations, responsibilities, dangers. Still, the reigning high priestess had taught her the old ways, helped her fulfill, fulfill her obligations and responsibilities, and trained her in the gifts, powers, and weapons of the priesthood. Breeson had learned well. When the old priestess died, Breeson, the designated successor, was elevated to her new rank and had led her people well. She had become renowned for her magical abilities, her leadership of the Council of Elders, and was thought to be the most capable of any in memory. Clarissa, the next in the line of succession that spanned three generations, lovingly tucked the cover around her to keep the old priestess warm. She wasn't cold, however, and pushed it back, only to have Clarissa tuck it in again. The dying priestess asked Clarissa for a drink of water. Clarissa almost jumped to bring her what she wanted. She loved the old priestess who had cared for her and trained her for the work that she would assume on the old one's passing, who then must train the next designee in the skills and powers of her office. It was a great honor to attend to the high priestess, especially on her deathbed and her skills of consolation, care, and empathy brought comfort to the dying priestess. She brought water and helped Breeson sit up momentarily to slake her thirst. Then she had finished drink when she had finished drinking, she lay back down. Clarissa watched as she fell into sleep. It was a time of peaceful tranquility and reflection. In the quiet, Clarissa noticed that she was almost out of fresh water, took the pitcher, and left for the sacred spring to get more. Outside the tranquil hut, there were others who were not so content. The guard at the gate muttered to himself about the dark and gloom that were his only companions during his watch. His cloak was wet, his feet were wet, 
and even though the night was warm, he was not happy. His head hurt from an excess of wine from the previous evening. He and his fellows had finished off a cask of wine at the tavern the night before. It had been rollicking fun then, but not so much now. He marveled that his aching head had not improved throughout the day. The midnight watch was the worst one. He resented the fact that he was stuck there in the rain that night. It was an honor to guard the compound of the high priestess, but not one he was enjoying at the moment. The watch passed slowly and was oh so uneventful. There is no danger here. Who would want to be out on a night like this, he thought to himself. He turned to try to hide from a sudden squall of rain that the wind was blowing first this way, then that, when something caught his eye. He watched as a bent and hooded figure slowly made her way toward the entrance. He was used to the old women out gathering kindling or mushrooms in the woods, but why would she be doing that now and in this weather, he wondered. The figure approached and appeared to be shuffling something under her dark hooded cloak. I wonder if you could help me, she asked the guard. He, being both honorable toward women, uh, well, especially old ones, and bored with the gloom of the evening, was more than happy to help, even with a pounding head. I'll help thee if I might, he replied. Please, it's this bundle, she said. The guard wondered at the old woman's burden. It was a cloth sack. There was something moving in the bag, almost writhing. It was curious. He never realized what was happening. As he moved to assist with her burden, the viper struck from the bag at the same time as the assassin struck from behind, both with deadly efficiency. The face of what he thought was an old woman was the next to the last thing he saw. The face was not old at all. He would have wondered at the beauty of it, even in the dark, as she straightened herself and stood erect. The last thing he saw was the head of a snake retreating into the sack. These were his images as he fell into the mud of that dark, rain-soaked night, held in a chokehold that prevented him from yelling an alert. His last thoughts were a jumble of choking, pain, wet, fear, and failure. Quickly, death relieved him of his suffering. The old or not-so-old woman smiled at how easy it had been. She shook the snake back into the bag. Stay warm, my lovely, she said. We will soon be back in our comfortable home. Just a little more work to do. Then she turned to her assassin assistant. She was proud. She had trained him, along with his fellows, into a cadre of extremely efficient assassins and killers. She called them her vipers, a lethal force unexcelled in this time in history. Combining her skills of hypnotism, drugs, and sex, she found that she had gained total control over the minds of men with strong bodies but weak minds. She smiled at the viper as he wiped his dagger on the wet clothing of his victim and looked with dull, expressionless eyes toward the woman for further instructions. Well done, she spoke. You will be rewarded. The viper assassin nodded in acknowledgment but without apparent expression or emotion. Now on to the goal, she said, as she slipped through the now unguarded door of the bungalow of the high priestess. The woman, carrying a bag of snakes and accompanied by her assassin, came to the door of the hut, looking inside and seeing no one but the high priestess lying in the bed. She entered. Oh, this looks so easy, she thought to herself. I could end it with a ball of fire, but the, the snakes were so much better. This way the thatch won't catch fire so that it would look as if she died in a fire. She wanted it to be known that this was murder. She went over to the dying woman and gently rubbed the hair from her forehead. The high priestess responded to the touch and opened her eyes. What she saw was not what she expected, not the compassionate face of Clarissa but the body of a large constrictor snake curling around her neck. 
She tried to move, but the ugly, brutish viper assassin pushed her back. She tried to muster her magic powers to resist, but she felt herself checked by the dark shamanistic power of the woman who stood over her. Near death, Brison, once the most powerful mega alive, was weak and powerless. She tried to shout, but the coils of the snake closed off her breath. She realized that she was dying, but not peacefully as she had anticipated, but being murdered by one with evil ability to match her own magic. Then she felt the sting of the fangs of a second, smaller viper as it pushed its deadly venom into her bloodstream. She ceased to struggle, hanging on to life in hope of warning Clarissa of the danger. The assassin recalled the constrictor, put it in a bag, and moved outside. When Clarissa returned, she noticed that the high priestess was struggling to breathe, then to her horror the fang marks. This was a murder, she thought to herself. As she herself was trying to understand what had happened, she suddenly felt the same sting of the fangs of the viper. The old woman had left to make sure the job was done. Clarissa screamed as the viper pulsed venom into her body. Her screams brought in attendants and others of the priesthood. They found that the high priestess was dead and Clarissa dying. The snake slid off under the bed and outside into the waiting bag of the assassin. Clarissa felt the venom spread through her body. She pushed through the cloud of horror, confusion, and grief that spread with the poison. Clarissa struggled to give Brisson's last words. She said, five, came the labored speech of Clarissa. Brisson said it twice, five, and her hand moved, as if to make certain that I knew she meant the number five. Then she died. Clarissa felt her own life slipping away. In a moment, both the high priestess and her heir apparent were dead. Outside, there was a cry of, The high priestess is dead! Long live the high priestess! Miles away, in a shop filled with cloth, ribbons, mannequins, and sleeping apprentices, the new high priestess awoke from a horrific nightmare, except that it wasn't a nightmare. She knew, she knew. She had looked to this day with a mix of excitement and dread, the day when she would assume the mantle of high priestess, but she had not anticipated the horror. She quickly donned her clothing, wrapped her cloak around her, and left the sleeping girls. She had to get back quickly, there were rituals to perform, burials to complete, hearts to console, responsibilities to assume. At the same time, in a dark corner of the rain-drenched village, a woman with a warm bag under her cloak crouched to appear to be aged and listened to the cries of grief from the village. Oh, so easy, oh, so easy, my lovelies, she cackled with glee. Already she was planning her next attack. Oh, so easy. Oh, so easy. She wrapped her cloak around herself and her precious bundle and walked off with her viper assassin through the chaos and dark. <laughs>